Emmanuel in Brooklyn, welcome to the show. Yes, Mr. Galloway, it's a pleasure to hear your voice. Um, you, I have a, a question and a comment, uh, something that's a very thorny issue. It has to do with this perception of race, and, and uh, especially as it applies to what would be considered self-identified white progressives, and I say self-identified for a reason, because it seems to me whenever there's a, a, an issue that comes up, that it might be a human issue, that it's just an issue of injustice, and it happens to be considered a racial issue, that somehow white progressives, especially in this country, seem to want to shy away from the blatant fact of what it is. And it, it might be coming from a guilt factor because of the, the way that the system structures itself, that it always gives a little more to the buffer. So it will give a little more to the self-identified white people, and then they're, they're able to defend the system in a guilt-type way and not see the issue for what it is. And so, therefore, you get this whole kind of, um, yes, I'm with you, but it might not be what it is. And there's this kind of delusion that goes along with, uh, quote-unquote, white progressivism that really is like a, a cog in, in the system, in the in terms of actually getting to fight against that system of injustice because I think that people who self-identify as white usually end up getting a little bit more crumbs off of the table. So they're, they're, they're more reluctant to go and go with the human factor of the situation instead of denouncing the, their whiteness. It's always somehow defending the system that it's not really what it is because they might be considered as traitors or they don't want to see the, the situation as blatantly as it really is. There's something about that that keeps the struggle not moving forward. Well, that's, that's, a very acute, uh, that, that's a very acute uh, observation. Um, I have slight difficulty in dealing with it in this sense. For some reason, whether genetic or uh, through nurture or through, I don't know, a divine chance, I have never in my life seen things through racial uh, prism. Ife, my friend who's running this show, is a really cool, fabulous black woman. And I've been lucky enough to meet her a few times. And I never felt in any sense that she was any different to me. Whereas with many white people, uh, many white people listening to this maybe, really hate me. And I probably would hate them if I knew them. And I don't love Ife because she's black, and I don't hate them because they're white. I hate them and love her because of who they are, not what color they are. So it's difficult for me to put myself in the shoes of this self-identified white person, even though I'm as white as can be with blue eyes and uh, an entirely European uh, heritage so far as I know. And, of course, none of us entirely knows that. Um, but you're right in the sense that you identify that the divide and rule that the previous caller was uh, talking about is most obviously practiced on a racial level. The reason why poor whites in the southern states of the United States of America went along with and uh, supported with their votes and even their ropes uh, the system of Jim Crow and the Klan and segregation and so on, was not actually because they had anything really to gain from that system, just that it meant that somebody else was worse off than them. And the crumbs that you talk about, the crumbs off the table, were all that they got out of it. The poor whites lived a miserable life in the southern states of the U.S., but they could put on a, a suit and hang a black man and feel that they somehow had a part of the system. Uh, and, uh, of course, we have to relentlessly, endlessly struggle against that. And that's why I didn't identify with the criticism of Sharpton, uh, because I don't know the, in, the specific case that was being referred to. But Sharpton, to me, insofar as I know him, which is relatively limited, is a person who relentlessly struggles against this fake, false consciousness of racial divide. That's how I see it. Fabulous. Lots of women call us. Linda, go ahead. Good morning, uh, Mr. Galloway. Congratulations uh, to your constituency that you won. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
uh, to the gentleman who was a couple of callers before me speaking about uh, whites vis-a-vis -vis, uh, or progressives vis-a-vis -vis, uh, black Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to me, if we were to spend the next 20 years just dropping everything on the left and working on nothing but the issue of racial justice, we might get 10% of the goal achieved. The the vitriol, the bigotry, et cetera, against blacks in the United States right now, even by my white friends mm. uh, who, who are not malignant in their bigotry, they're quiet about it, is still so enormous, and it's a tragedy. Uh, it makes me cry. A black person is a black person 24-7. We can't mm. let that issue rest. And the, oh, I, I agree with that. Um, it is and terrible. The, the, only, the only caveat I would make is this. Yeah. And this, this is something I've practiced all my life. If I meet a racist, uh, I don't walk by nor do uh, I. And I don't, and I don't slap their face. No. I talk, I engage with them. Yeah. And I did it a lot in Bradford. There's a lot of really poor whites in Bradford, uh, who have, through this false consciousness, become, uh, people who blame the other. Yeah. Not the rich. They don't blame the system. They don't blame the politicians. They, uh, identify to a grotesque extent with British Imperial War and so on. Uh, but they blame the person who's different to them in the yeah. same street uh, and who moreover has a better sense of community and society than they do. They go to mosques, they have clubs, they have um, halls that they meet in, never very good, but they meet and they have a collectivity which poor white people uh, don't have. And the poor white person has privatized himself into his own family or even into himself. Often they don't have a family or they've lost it. And they take recourse in alcohol and sometimes in drugs and certainly often in hatred and alienation. So I engage these people. I go after them. If they shout abuse at me, I go after them. Yeah. Literally go after them. I, I touch their shoulder and turn them around and force them to talk to me. And I give them my phone number. There's one young man in particular uh, by the name of Nicky who I won his heart. And yet he turned up at the launch of my campaign to shout abuse in defense of British imperial policy. But I talked that fellow round. I persuaded him that his interests were the same as the black guy up the road. His interests for a job, for security, for uh, a better life were exactly the same. The only thing different between him and them was that they prayed and their face was slightly more brown than his. Well, I agree uh, though, with you, George. But one, yeah. one thing I'd like to refer people to, I don't know whether it's on Google, uh, this, Mike Wallace died, uh, this week. Uh, the journalist, I, I, 93, died at 93, I just saw that a minute ago, yeah. yeah. And I would encourage people to, if it's on Google or somewhere, to check out the interview that he did with Lorraine Hansberry, the, the playwright who wrote Raisin yeah. in the Sun. Yeah. Uh, probably in the 60s. And for, for both blacks and whites. Now she was raised in an upper middle class family in New York. Mike Wallace didn't know what he was about to encounter. He went in there with all of his assumptions about blacks, mm -hmm. which he'd been raised with. Uh, and he uh, it, did not engage her as a human being. She became a target in the interview of every inadequacy he felt. Mm. And it, it, uh, anyway, uh, what I wanted it's to very say, interesting. No, very interesting. Yeah, you made your point very check, well. To check it out, that the assumptions that we make about other races are based on our own inadequacies from the way we've been treated by this system. We pass it on, and it's our great loss not to re-examine that. And if we can convince people that by by eliminating other people from our consciousness, et cetera, we, if nothing else, it's, it's already happened to us, the fact that we're doing it to others. Yeah. Um, anyway, I can't even speak great point. No, no, you made, no, no, you made, you made some great points. Yeah. Thanks very much okay, for the call, George. indeed. Hey, how you Mike doing? Mike in great New Jersey, welcome usual. to the show. Great show. I, look, my descendants are all European. 
And on any given day, I could be a, an Italian, I could be a Puerto Rican, I could even pass for a Mexican. This idea of whiteness or blackness or whatever the color, as long as those color designations. By the way, I've never seen a yellow man, as one famous man on uh, one of the shows on BAI said, I've never seen a yellow man. This uh, identification with this color, whiteness, profits certain types of people and... Uh, disenfranchises others, and the same thing with blackness. The minute you play into this color thing, I've never seen. There's just explain to me what a Hispanic is, because I'd like to know. I've got Hispanic friends. It's not even a race. So oh. as long as we're uh, playing by these phony race categories, in fact, somebody explain to me what white is. I'd like to know. A million dollars to you if you can explain to me adequately what white is or what uh, Hispanic is. Please. It's a phony a way of controlling the masses. Keeping them, It's a pie. You got the most of them identified with white. You keep those, put it against the other ones. It's that simple. Color is phony. Disassociate yourself from color and everything will be fine. Well, I, I, I agree to a very large extent with that. Hispanic is not a race. What is white? Um, I'm pretty white, uh, but I'm not. But I was uh, uh, hailed by the Voice newspaper in London, which is the main uh, black uh, newspaper in the country, as Britain's finest black leader, black political leader. Uh, and it, it began with the line, uh, George Galloway may be a pale-faced brother, but uh, he's, uh, he's a better black leader than any of the black leaders we've got in the United Kingdom. And I was extremely proud of that, not because of pigmentation, but because black is a political color. Uh, people are black because they're discriminated against. People are black because they're the victims of, of uh, discrimination and hatred and uh, are uh, in danger of being entirely alienated from our societies on both sides of the Atlantic. So we need to reach out to people as people. Uh, as it happens, I'm a religious believer. I believe that we're all God's children, that God made us different for a variety of reasons, but that fundamentally we're the same and that we are each other's keeper. Uh, uh, everyone is our brother and sister. This is my creed. This is what I believe. And uh, I live my life uh, in that way.